It's Tuesday, January 24. In the headlines, FBI called in to assist in SSL probe. In business news, new policies for financial sector. Regionally in Trinidad and Tobago, new energy legislation coming soon. Internationally, Australia and China seek to mend trade ties. And in sports, we're on the pitch with cricket, taking a look at a recent match between Windies women and India. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The public is still reeling from what is being described as one of the largest financial securities fraud in the last two decades. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says no stone will be left unturned as the investigative authorities work to secure information in the alleged massive fraud at the Stocks and Securities Limited, SSL. He gave an update at a press brief on Monday. Carla Thomas Hewitt has the details. 13 years. That's how long fraudulent activities have allegedly been happening at Stocks and Securities Limited, SSL. The revelation was made by Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark. Perhaps even longer. With external auditors, regulators, managers, bankers, and later internal auditors, how did this fraud go undetected for 13 years? I put it to you that that is the central question. And it is a question that our government will ensure is answered. Dr. Clark says the Federal Bureau of Investigations has been called in to assist. If and when such assets are identified, all legal steps will be taken to restrain these assets with the intention of full forfeiture. Having spoken with some of those leading the investigation, I can say that they are resolute and determined to unravel its complexities and bring all responsible to justice. In fact, based on the magnitude of this fraud and the lines of inquiry being pursued, the Financial Investigations Division and the Fraud Squad have already, last week, sought assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, and other international partners. With at least $3 billion said to have been allegedly stolen from the clients at SSL, the finance minister notes the negative effect this can have on public confidence in Jamaica's financial institutions. So the government is moving to establish new policies and regulations to improve the sector. These include a special resolution regime law to strengthen the resolution of non-viable financial institutions while protecting financial stability and the public funds in line with fund staff recommendations. And we have committed to a date of March 2024 to submit this law to Parliament. It also includes a methodology via the BOJ consultation paper to identify systemically important bank and non-bank financial institutions. And, it <clears throat> and we have committed to a date of September 2023 to submit this to Parliament. Sprint legend Usain Bolt is among at least 40 investors hit by the fraud, which is being investigated by the Police Fraud Squad, the Financial Investigations Division, and the FSC. Bolt's attorney, Linton Gordon, in his January 16 letter to SSL, had pointed out that the Olympian had established an account with SSL via a limited liability company, essentially for his pension. The attorney stated that on October 31, 2022, the account showed a balance of U.S. $12.7 million. However, on the date when he wrote the letter, Gordon said the account had been depleted to U.S. $12,000. SSL has been given 10 days to return the funds. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carla Thomas Hewitt. Meanwhile, four members of the board of the Financial Services Commission, FSC, have stepped down to make way for new appointments. Speaking at a media brief on Monday, Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, said Bank of Jamaica Governor Richard Biles will chair the FSC board. 
He will be joined on the board of the FSC by Mr. Wayne Robinson, Senior Deputy Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Mr. G. D. Lewis, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, in charge of supervision, Mr. George Roper, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, in charge of finance, technology, and administration, and a former Deputy Executive Director of the FSC. And another person who I'm not yet prepared to name. Four commissioners from the previous board will remain. They are Mr. Irwin Burton, former Deputy CEO of Grace Kennedy. Mr. Dennis Brown, retired partner of PWC, Kanisha Davis, attorney at law, and Mrs. Hillary Robinson, senior director at the Bank of Jamaica on secondment at the finance ministry. The immediate responsibilities of the new board, in addition to what would customarily, or what customarily applies, are to one, oversee the current intervention in SSL, there's a temporary manager in place, Establish a mechanism to review the FSC's approach to the SSL case in order to identify any gaps or constraints and to assess the status of other licensees and whether there are concerns or potential concerns in respect of any company in the securities industry, just for absolute SSL was incorporated in 1973. They commenced business in 1977, primarily as a brokerage focusing on Jamaica stock trades. In 1996, they added securities dealer license to their portfolio to permit them to deal securities in Jamaica. Students at Trenchtown Polytechnic College will now have hands-on training as forklift operators. Tankweld and two of its suppliers have come together to provide a forklift with additional tools for the training. Tankweld Managing Director John Ralston explains how the program will be sustained. We wish the college, its staff and students the best of luck and look forward to seeing many certified operators entering the workforce very, very soon. The school's principal, Dr. Dasset Edwards Watson, says her team will be using the donated forklift to certify individuals. We will train and certify individuals, scores, hundreds, thousands of individuals, initially with the NCT VET Level 2 certification, but it will serve as income generating, uh, income generating opportunity for the numerous outside initiatives the institution has towards growth and sustainability. We will offer demand-driven, dual certification, micro-credential, and bespoke training. And by bespoke, I mean if it is that you have need, we can come in and design a program for you. Plans are also afoot for a welding and fabrication program. And that's a conversation we would have started with Chris Bignell from as far back as 2015. So. Since that conversation, we have the welding room ready and all the welding boots are in place, except we do not now have a welding plant, well, until now. So we wanted to have a welding and fabrication program where we would do the production and repair of school furniture. We would do some production of functional art and garden furniture for a social entrepreneurship Initiative. The entire project is expected to cost just about $4 million over the next three years. At Trenchstone Polytechnic, the team aims to eliminate academic failure or frustration, minimize disciplinary referrals, and develop students' potentials to the fullest. They do this by making teaching and learning their core business. People with disabilities often have more health needs than the general population. In the past, this reality was thought to be an unavoidable consequence for people with disabilities. But this is not true. The real challenge more often comes from the broader inequality of access to healthcare services and processes. Let's hear what the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, has to say about the issue in this week's Living Healthy Report. Healthcare inequalities are a very real and pressing issue in many parts of the world, especially the Americas. Access to proper healthcare is a fundamental human right, yet many are denied this simply because of their disability. Lack of awareness, stigma, and prejudice give rise to additional barriers faced by persons with disabilities. 
These include physical, digital, informational, attitudinal, institutional, and cultural barriers. Disability is not an illness, and yet many people with disabilities are often marginalized and treated as if they are somehow less than everyone else. This needs to change. Now let's look at some stories that showcase the daily barriers people with disabilities face when accessing healthcare. Julia, born blind, is at the grocery store. While standing in front of the shelves of cereal, she wanted to buy something healthy but could not read the nutritional labels. Julia previously was unable to find the product in an accessible format online. She wished she could ask someone mm. for help, but didn't want to bother anyone. After standing a while, trying to figure it out on her own, she eventually gave up and just chose a cereal at random. She hoped it would be good for her, but she didn't really know. Manuel was diagnosed with an intellectual disability at a young age. When it came time to get vaccinated, Manuel was confused and scared about what would happen. The nurse tried to explain the process to him. Unfortunately, the information was presented to him in medical jargon that Manuel didn't understand. He was left feeling more anxious, scared, and alone. He decided not to take the vaccine until he understood it better. Gonzalo was born with muscular dystrophy, and it had gradually progressed. He was now at the point where he needed help with his daily living activities, like getting out of bed and bathing. But one day, his caregiver didn't show up. Gonzalo waited and waited, but they never came. This repeated scenario can complicate health problems and even make them worse for Gonzalo, including increasing the anxiety and depression. When it comes to treatment, there are often unintentional but very real accessibility barriers. People with disabilities often face problems when it comes to transportation to and from healthcare centers. Even health facilities often are difficult to access and navigate around or lack necessary equipment such as accessible scales, patient lifts, and adjustable dentist chairs. These problems are exacerbated by communication and social attitudinal barriers of health personnel. Time now for the business report with Danita Rodney. Speaking on Monday at a press briefing to address issues related to the financial sector, Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, says Jamaica's financial sector remains strong and vibrant. He says the government plans to strengthen the regulatory environment by overarching the regulatory structure to monitor the financial sector. Fragmented supervision can lead to regulatory gaps in a landscape such as ours, where financial conglomerates dominate. In addition, there's often duplication of effort, duplicate oversight, and sometimes coordination challenges. Dr. Clark says the government of Jamaica will pursue a unification of presidential supervision and regulation. The prudential supervision and regulation of deposit-taking financial institutions commercial banks, which, which are commercial banks, billing societies, merchant banks, credit unions, which are currently supervised by the BOJ, and non-bank financial institutions, which are security dealers, insurance companies, and pension funds, will be consolidated into one institution, the Bank of Jamaica, and a separate regulator for will be given the responsibility for market conduct and consumer protection for the full spectrum of financial services. This unification should result in consumers and clients having better protection against unfair practices and fraud. This includes monitoring compliance with laws and regulations related to consumer protection, anti-money laundering and anti-fraud measures. It also includes monitoring the sales and marketing practices of financial institutions to ensure that they're not engaging in deceptive or misleading conduct. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for January 23, the US dollar sold for an average of $155.03, the Canadian dollar ended trading at $120.98, the 
the pound sterling traded for $188.97 and the euro sold for an average of $167.34. In GSC trading, the GSC index declined by 632 points. The junior market index declined by 24 points. The combined market index declined by 821 points. And the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 840 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 115 stocks of which 37 advanced, 55 declined and 23 traded firm. Stocks advanced for Barita Investments Limited, Berger Plains Jamaica Limited and Cargo Handlers Limited. Stocks declined for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Trading firm were 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited Verbal Preference, CAC 2000 Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. The overall volume leaders were Image Plus Consultants Limited with over 7 million units. Wigs and Windform Limited Ordinary Shares with over 4 million units and Fosswitch Company Limited with over 2 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Macro Index Fund traded over 500 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Epic Caribbean Property Fund Value Fund was a sole security trading over 10,000 shares. In regional business, a new partnership among Trinidad and Tobago, Ghana and the other gas producing nations in the Southern Caribbean region could help meet the region's energy needs, so says Trinidad and Tobago's Energy Minister Stuart Young. We are perfectly positioned, not only geographically are we perfectly positioned as I listen to, to my fellow panelists, Trinidad and Tobago's infrastructure I cannot overemphasize. The regional play that can take place as we link hands with Suriname, Guyana, Barbados, Grenada, and bring gas to Trinidad and Tobago into our infrastructure, that is something that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Go and check it. Every other province is sort of locked by itself. We have that ability right here in Trinidad. That's you can never tell a politician just one thing, right? So I just I have to add, I, 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 I just have to add. <laughs> on the energy efficiency side, I wanted to tell you all that the government is very aware. I've heard Jerome speak about it, Mark speak about it, others speak about it. We have already begun the process of looking at how we can get more efficient production of electricity. The first set of back of the envelope calculations show that if we make some changes, that is the independent power producers, we can save a tremendous amount of gas that can then be sent to the estate or LNG. That is something that we've instructed from a policy point of view, be done immediately. But the big point that Trinidad and Tobago don't miss the opportunity. This is our opportunity. We're perfectly poised where we are geographically. You have Venezuela there, you have Suriname, Guyana, you have Trinidad and Tobago with the infrastructure. There are possible fines in Barbados. We've already signed agreements with Grenada. Can you imagine the energy security and the sustainability for the region that we can bring if we all push in the right direction working together? For the security of this region, for the energy needs security of this region, I once again reinforce the call that every country in the region with potential in natural gas should be allowed to explore that potential to its fullest aggressively to ensure the energy security of this region. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, that opportunity exists and that opportunity should be allowed to blossom for the benefit of the people of this region and the globe. In market data for oil, crude oil prices were steady as concerns about the global economic slowdown and expected build in U.S. oil inventories were offset by hopes of a fuel demand recovery from top importer China. Brent crude was up seven cents at eighty-eight dollars twenty-six cents a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude rose fourteen cents to eighty-one dollars seventy-six cents. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. 
In regional news, on Monday, the Governor General of Antigua and Barbuda, Sir Rodney Williams, appointed the members of Parliament who will sit on the government benches for the next term. Jamie J. Roche has the details. Governor General Sir Rodney Williams appoints the senators who will represent the government in Parliament's upper house. I, Samantha Nicole Marshall, do swear that I will honor, uphold, and preserve the constitution of Antigua and Barbuda and the law. Former St. Mary South Representative Samantha Marshall takes the oath of office, allegiance, and secrecy. She will lead government business in the Senate and is also Minister for State with responsibility for social transformation. Senator Mary Claire Hurst will serve as Senator Marshall's deputy. In the meantime, Senator Alencia Williams Grant will resume her role as President of the Senate. The Constitution allows the Prime Minister to advise the Governor General on the appointment of seven other government senators. I, Shanella Mary Shadida Gavaya. I, Clement Marley Mandela Antonio. I, Philip Shaul. I, Osbert Richard Frederick. I, Colin O'Neill Brown. I, Caleb Van Lee Gardner. I, Rodden Antonio Nairobi Turner. Do swear that I will honor, uphold, and preserve the Constitution of Antigua and Barbuda and the law that I will conscientiously, impartially, and to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as a senator and do right to all manner of people without fear or favor, affection or ill will. So help me God. Sorani also appoints Nacinta Ned Charles as the senator for Barbuda. Senators Gavaya, Antonio, and Ned Charles will also serve as parliamentary secretaries in separate ministries. In Trinidad and Tobago, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley says the government will pass new laws to encourage the move to renewable energy. While addressing the 2023 Energy Conference on Monday, the Prime Minister said other countries are using these measures to incentivize the industry. In the near future, we in Trinidad and Tobago will be introducing feed-in tariff legislation as part of our strategy to encourage low-carbon generation technologies and renewable energy generation. He noted in recent months the National Gas Company was able to save this country billions of dollars. The National Gas Company will shortly begin the round of discussions on new gas sales contracts. The Energy Conference will run until Wednesday at the Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain. In Guyana, with the government on an aggressive path to expand agriculture, Minister of Labour Joseph Hamilton on Monday indicated that the government will be seeking to repossess tens of thousands of acres of land which are held by cooperative societies but are lying waste. Cooperative societies, they have in their hands Lands that belongs to the state, tens of thousands of acres that are unproductive. Most of it, in many instances, are run by some family or some one man who took it over. That will took it over and it's unproductive. Let me clarify. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, where are the lands and surveys? Where are the Forestry Commission? Where are the MMA? We will have to make those lands productive because as we continue to speak about food security and agricultural expansion, we cannot afford, the nation cannot afford that tens of thousands of acres that are in the hands of pop societies, they continue to be unproductive. I have tasked the co-op department, and we have just concluded an integrity audit of co-op societies so that we could understand the state of play. And Mr. Speaker, as we go forward, and I make no apologies for this, Nobody's asking for one. I have asked Lands and Surveys, I have asked the Forest Research Commission, I have asked the MMA, to make available the information to us as to the amount of lands that co-op societies they have in their position. Those that are 
want to work for development, we will work with them. But what we will not continue to have happen, people utilizing the farcical umbrella of co-op societies when they have government land in their possession. And I have no apologies to make. The action, as I said, is either they resolve these matters or they will be dissolved. In international news, Australia and China's trade ties are likely to be back to normal with the two promising to mend relations after about a two-year ban on commodity imports. It was this meeting between Xi Jinping and Anthony Albanese on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Indonesia in November that indicated relations between Australia and China were out of the diplomatic deep freeze. Two years after Beijing placed an unofficial ban on Australian lobster, coal, barley, wine and beef, industry leaders are optimistic the next step will be the lifting of those trade restrictions. We'd like to get it back there if we could. Live lobsters into China represented 98% of our trade for lobster alone. So plenty of comment going on about China opening up, and particularly with the trade relations improving. Australia used to be the second largest supplier of coal to China. That ground to a halt in 2020, when the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison demanded an independent investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. Now in a partial resumption of trade, four major Chinese companies, including power generators and one steel mill, have been cleared to import Australian coal. Yes, we welcome the opportunity and we're optimistic that China will open its, its imports to us again, but uh, we have diversified away from China and so it will be very competitive in terms of uh, being able to supply uh, any, uh, any orders into China. Tariffs and bans imposed by Beijing have impacted Australian exports worth $14 billion a year, actions that are now before the World Trade Organisation. Canberra has indicated it would be willing to reconsider its case if Beijing lifts restrictions. We shouldn't be overconfident, we shouldn't be complacent. We should continue to try to diversify our trade base and the like because the geopolitical problems with China aren't going to go away in the short term. Analysts say the rebuilding of political trust will also take time. Trade Minister Don Farrell will meet his Chinese counterpart virtually in coming weeks. It's the latest sign of efforts to try and stabilise what has been a turbulent relationship with Australia's largest trading partner. The ministerial meeting will be the first in more than three years. Sarah Clark, Al Jazeera, Brisbane. In sports, we take a look at the second tri-series match between India and the Windies women. As preparations for the upcoming T20 World Cup continue, the West Indies women went down to India in their second Tri-Nation Series game taking place in East London. Smriti Mandana led India women to an imposing 167 for two thanks to her knock of 74 not out from 51 balls. Harman Preet Kaur smashed an unbeaten 35 ball 56 to add to the onslaught of runs. Shanika Bruce was the standout bowler for the Windies, taking one of the two fallen wickets for 20 five runs from her four overs. Needing 168 for the win, the Windies woman struggled against the potent India bowling attack, at one point trying at 25 for three. A fourth wicket stand of 71 between Sherman Campbell, who scored 47, and Haley Matthews, not out on 34, provided hope to the innings. But the burden was just too much to bear as they surrendered on 111 for four, giving India victory by 56 runs. And that's the news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thanks so much for watching.